Hello and welcome to lecture 64 of my class from Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor, and today's lecture is an introduction to design of experiments. In fact, this is the first of a series of lectures to discuss a very important topic, designing experiments. So far we've been talking about taking data and analyzing it. So taking the data and fitting a model to it, for example. Uh, but Eventually, or earlier, somebody had to design the experiment that generated the data that we then collect. So we're kind of going backwards of uh, before you even start to make a measurement, you have to design the experiment that you want to run. Well, we can think of this experiment as some kind of a process. And this process has inputs and outputs. We're going to try to understand the relationship between inputs and outputs. And to do so, we have to think about three different kinds of outputs. First is the, excuse me, three different kinds of inputs. Uh, the first is the controlled inputs. These are the things that we're purposely varying in our experiment. And we want to, generally, what we want to do is try to understand the controlled inputs and how they affect the outputs. But there are other kinds of inputs as well that are uncontrolled. These are things that we're not purposely manipulating or we're not able to hold constant. And those uncontrolled inputs have two kinds as well. We have some uncontrolled inputs that we can observe, that is, we can measure, but we can't control them. There are other kinds of uncontrolled inputs that we can that we don't control and we don't even measure them or observe them. Uh, and we're going to have to treat these uncontrolled inputs a little bit differently give you an example. Suppose I'm running an experiment and this experiment is just done in the, in the lab and the lab has some basic ability to control the temperature and humidity of the atmosphere in the room, doesn't have any ability to control the uh, barometric pressure. And maybe my uh, measurement is a delicate optical measurement and temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure affects the optical properties of the air, the refractive index of the air. And so I get slightly different results because of these changes. Well, they're, they're sort of controlled in terms of temperature and humidity, but not perfectly, not very well. So we can consider them uncontrolled inputs. Well, even though they're uncontrolled, I can observe them. I can measure the temperature, humidity, the barometric pressure in the room. And uh, I can then take advantage of that information which we'll talk about. But there also might be some uncontrolled and unobserved inputs. Maybe there's some uh, natural vibration of certain frequencies that are wiggling my experimental setup and I, I don't control it and I don't measure it either. Well, how we think about these three kinds of inputs depends on what we're trying to do with our experiment. Um, first of all, let me define a term that we'll use again called nuisance inputs. Nuisance inputs are inputs that we don't really care about. I'm not interested in understanding how temperature affects my process or how barometric pressure affects my house process. I'm not that I don't care about that. That's not my purpose of my experiment. But they do affect the outputs. So I have to worry about them. So that's why we say nuisance, right? If if they don't affect the output, then I don't worry about them at all. But if some uncontrolled input does affect the output, it's a nuisance input as opposed to a controlled or desired input. How we deal with these three classes of inputs depends on what our goals are for, for the experiment. One goal is modeling or characterization. We want to simply understand the process. How do inputs affect outputs? Um, but another possibility, especially in processes involved in, say, manufacturing, our goal is to optimize. We want to optimize the process so that we get the output that we want. What input values produce best properties of my output? Usually both the mean, uh, hitting the mean properly, or and reducing the variance about that mean. Another option is a control option. It's like the optimization in that you're trying to hit a particular output, but in a control problem, that target, the thing that we're trying to achieve, can change. So if our target changes, what changes in the input allow us to move the output 
to its new target value. That's the process of control. And how we deal with uh, characterizing this process depends on which uh, of these types of, of characterization and modeling we're trying to achieve. What's our goal? So let, how do we deal with these three types of inputs? First of all, the controlled inputs X, well, uh, we use our control over them to perform the experiment. We vary the inputs, we repeat experiments in a systematic way in order to learn about how these inputs affect the outputs. The uncontrolled but observed inputs, we have two choices, and we're gonna talk about both of these in coming lectures. One choice is called blocking. This is where we group the experiments into blocks, each block having smaller variation in U or a fixed value of U, ideally. Uh, between blocks, from one block to the next block, we might have some variation in the input. Let's go back to the example I said before. Say barometric pressure. What, what changes barometric pressure? Weather. Low front, high front moves through, the weather changes, we get a different barometric pressure. I know that barometric pressure affects this delicate optical measurement I'm making, this experiment that I'm running. So what I'd like to do is block up my experiment so all the experiments I want to compare to each other are done over a short enough period of time that the barometric pressure is not changing. That's usually during one day, an afternoon, something like that. And then uh, I can do another block of experiments on a different day. That might have a different barometric pressure, but at least within that block, they all have a fixed value at uncontrolled but observed input. The analysis of covariance is another way of dealing with uncontrolled but observed inputs, and that is to model the impact of that input on the output and then subtract out that effect, essentially correct my observations for this uncontrolled but observed input. And finally, we have the uncontrolled and unobserved inputs. Uh, those, this is the really tough one. And the key insight here is randomization. We're going to randomize uh, the collection of our data, performance of our experiment, in such a way that on average, the uncontrolled and unobserved inputs um, are, can be averaged out. The impact, I should say, of those inputs can be averaged out to zero on average. If, of course, I have to have a sufficient number of, of uh, measurements or observations to make that happen. So we use randomization to affect the uncontrolled and unobserved inputs, and we use blocking or analysis of covariance for the uncontrolled or observed inputs. We're going to talk about both of those topics in some humming lectures in more detail. All right. What is experimental design? We design our experiments for the simple but important goal of getting the most information from the least data. The principle is simple. Data is expensive. Collecting data takes time and costs money. So what we want to do is get maximize the amount of information that we can get from the data that we do collect. We'd always love to have more data. Everything gets better with more data. Sometimes we're limited, either because of time or cost. So how can we get the most information from that data? An experiment is the deliberate variation of one or more variables while observing the effect on one or more responses. So we deliberately change an input and observe an output that results. This is as opposed to an observation, an observational study, where we observe both the inputs and the outputs, and we're not manipulating or controlling them. So experiments are the foundation of how we learn things in science. The design of experiments is a process for planning experiments to provide valid decisions in the most efficient way possible. Now, I say valid conclusions. What I mean by that is, in the, in the context of this course, statistically valid. That is, we have to have enough power in our experiment so that the standard errors around our statistic of interest are sufficiently small that I can draw the conclusion I want. I can answer the research questions. The purpose of the experiment can be achieved. Uh, 
and we want to do that efficiently. That is, you can always make these standard errors, error bars smaller by collecting more and more and more and more data. But no matter what, there's a limit to the amount of data you collected. So uh, how can we get the smallest error bars for the given amount of data we have? That's design of experiments. What do we use design of experiments for? Well, there's three major uses. First is exploratory work. We have a new experimental situation, a new um, environment where we're not exactly sure how all the inputs affects the outputs, and we want to explore. Uh, we want to choose between two alternatives, you know, maybe process A versus process B. We want to look at the key factors that affect the response. Right? If you think about what is everything that affects the output in this process, you might come up with an extremely long list of possibilities. So you want to find out what are the key factors, the things that affect it most. This is a process we call screening. Then, given that you've gotten some set of key factors that, that affect the response, key variables, variables you want to study, we might use DOE to optimize that process. This is, we're going to use a, and talk about a, something called response surface modeling that helps us optimize a process to hit and control target response. Sometimes we want to maximize or minimize a response. Uh, we want to maximize yield. We want to minimize defects, for example. And sometimes we want to simply increase the robustness of our process so that small changes in the inputs only have minimal effect on the outputs. This is all part of process optimization. We use DOE quite extensively for these kinds of problems. And the third way in which we can use design of experiments is for regression or modeling. We want to develop a model. We want the model to be as good as we can, design our experiments to get the best modeling results. Well, since uh, uh, regression and modeling has been the topic of, of conversation in this class for quite a while, let's talk about that first. Then I'll come back to these other ideas of, of screening and, and response surface modeling in some upcoming lectures. So what is DOE for regression? Well, basically, I have some given n, some number of data points that I'm, I'm willing to collect. Designing for regression means picking the values of the predictor variables. In my experiment, in order to get best statistical behavior of the thing that I'm interested in. An example might be, I want the smallest standard errors of the coefficients model, or maybe specific coefficients in my model. Uh, I might want the smallest standard errors of the predictions. Maybe I want the smallest standard errors of the predictions over the full range of input predictor variables, or maybe I want the smallest standard error of the predictions over a particular range of the predictor variables. And there can be some other statistical behavior that I'm interested in. Given a goal that you want to achieve, uh, we can find the design that optimizes that goal. This process is called optimal design. In general, it requires some kind of a numerical search for a given model. Um, but for a few simple cases, we can analytically derive what the optimal design is. I'm going to talk more about optimal design in the next lecture, but let me give you a, a, a simple example so that you can understand the basics of it. A simple example will be for a simple linear regression. In other words, I've got a straight line model, and I want to optimize my design of the experiment for the smallest standard errors of the coefficients, slope and intercept. All right, so I've got a straight line model and one predictor variable, and I know exactly what the equations are for the variance of the slope and the variance of the estimate of the intercept. You see it's a, of course, a function of the standard error of the variance of the residuals, but it's also divided by this sum of xi minus x bar quantity squared. Right? xi is the values of the x variables. This is what I'm designing. I'm deciding what values of xi to use in my experiment. x bar <coughs> anything that minimizes the variance of the slope 
also minimizes variance of the intercept. So how do I do that? How can I make this quantity as big as possible? Excuse me. Yeah, as big as possible. I want these xi's to be as far away from the mean as possible. That's what makes this thing large, the denominator large, therefore the standard error of the slope small. So I think you could logically think about it and realize that if I picked half of my data points at the lowest x value that I want to explore, and the other half of the data points to be at the highest x value that I want to explore, then I will get minimum standard error of the slope. We call this a dumbbell design. All the data points are, are clumped at the two ends of the range. And I'll talk about some of the trade-offs of this, but basically uh, it goes exactly to the opposite of what we're used to thinking about our designs where we space evenly the x values from a min to a max. Well, that spacing of the x values evenly is useful if we want to understand what model is most appropriate. If we already have the model that we know is appropriate, then it's not the most efficient design. I'll show you the example, right? I'm going to fit a straight line to a set of data points. Um, here is the what's called the space filling design. That is, I evenly space out, I fill the space evenly between a min and a max range. And then I fit the line. I get an R squared, I get a standard error of the slope. Now, suppose instead I did a dumbbell design, I piled up half of the data at the minimum value, half the data at the maximum value, and then I fit a straight line. Now, in this case, the standard error of the residuals is exactly the same between these two cases. But look at the R squared, it's much higher. Look at the standard error of the slope for this dumbbell design, it's much lower. In fact, the dumbbell designs will always minimize the standard error of the slope um, given a certain standard error of residuals. Now, what can't we see from the dumbbell design? Oh, we can't see if our model is a good one or not. Right? Uh, I, I have no information as to whether or not you know, the true behavior of the data looks like uh, an exponential growth or it's leveling off at the top or it's going through some more complicated shape or behavior. I can't see that. Uh, I I'm, have to trust my assumption that a linear model is a good one. Whereas the space filling design helps me explore the possibility of other alternate models. So for the case of a straight line model with one predictor, I can in fact derive analytical expressions for the standard error as a function of the experimental design. So for example, for the dumbbell design, the standard error of the slope, where I put half of the data at one extreme and the other half of the data at the other extreme, is going to be the standard error of the residuals divided by the square root of the number of data points and divided by half range. x max minus x min is the range of the predictor variable divided by 2. Now, what if I did the more common space filling design where my data is spaced evenly apart between the min and the max. Well, I can again derive exactly what the standard error is going to be, and it turns out that it, it assuming a you know random di distribution of, of errors about that um, straight line model, it's equal to the standard error of the dumbbell design multiplied by something like the square root of three. If n is kind of large, that turns into the square root of 3. Square root of 3 is 1.73. In other words, the standard error of the slope for my space filling design is 70% bigger than the standard error I get if I used a dumbbell design, it's just like what we saw in the previous slide. Here's another possible design. It's called a quadratic design. Here I take one-third of the data points. I put them at the minimum. One-third I put in the middle and one third of the data points I stick at the maximum value of x. For this quadratic design, standard error of the slope is the standard error of the dumbbell design times the square root of 3 halves. Square root of 3 halves is about 1.2, about 20% more standard error. 
Now, as you might imagine, quadratic design enables me to test the assumption that uh, the, the line is straight as compared to an alternative uh, of, of a quadratic behavior. So the quadratic design allows me to check the uh, assumption of a linear model against at least an alternative assumption of a quadratic model. I, I pay the price of about 20% higher standard error in, in the slope, but I'm not pay, paying nearly the plight by 70% increase in standard error for the space filling design. Another goal in experimental design is to equalize the leverage during multiple regression in particular. So uh, we've already seen in our previous work on regression that we have to worry about leverage. If some points have far more leverage than average, those points are much can be much more influential in the fit. Well, that can lead to all kinds of complications. It would sure be nice if all of the data points in my design had about the same leverage. And I wouldn't have to worry about that. Well, how can we do that? Uh, uh, one goal of experimental design is to make the leverage of a specific point equal to the average leverage of all the points. We know the average leverage is P over N, where P is the number of parameters in the model, N is the number of data points. Okay. Let's take uh, the simple case, the case of only one predictor variable. If I have only one predictor variable, here is the exact expression leverage. What I want is to make that exactly equal to 2 over n because I only have two parameters. How do I do that? Well, here's 1 over n. So that may, must mean this must also be 1 over n. How can I make this 1 over n? I can only make this 1 over n if xi minus x bar quantity is squared is a constant. It's the same for every i. If that's the case, then I will have equal leverage for every data point. If we go back to our, uh, our example of the dumbbell design, and we see that that, in fact, is, is what it does. The dumbbell design makes xi minus x bar quantity squared the same for every data point. And therefore, the dumbbell design achieves its minimum standard error of the slope by equalizing the leverage of every data point. And we can do this a similar kind of thing uh, when we have multiple regression as well. All right, let me conclude this introduction by discussing the six principles of regression design. And we're going to revisit these principles next time and in coming lectures. Uh, first of all, I got this, these six principles from this great NIST Symantec uh, handbook on statistical methods available online, which I refer to frequently. Uh, there's a link to it on the course webpage as well. First of all, design a an experiment for the purpose of regression. You want to make sure that the experiment has the capacity to do a good job of validating your primary model. Uh, if, if you're trying to fit a straight line, that generally means having the range of x values to be as large as possible to get the best uh, result. You don't want all the range, x values to be the same value. You can't, you can't get that. Um, but you also want a capacity for an alternate model. If you're not sure the primary model is correct, you might have an alternate model as well. And you'd like the experiment to be able to allow you to choose between those two. So that's called capacity for the alternate model. Uh, think about a straight line model, but maybe as an alternate quadratic model, second order model. We would like to have the minimum variance of either the estimated coefficients or predictive values or some similar kind of metric. That's what we call optimal design. Uh, in everything except very simple cases, we have to do a numerical search to find that optimal design. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture. Uh, there's a principle called sample where the variation is. When things are, are constant, we don't need to sample um, very much in that region. Um, we, we need to have repeats and or replication. 
in order to get some kind of an estimate of the process variation that's independent of our model, right? Uh, because we want to both check the variation in the process and check the, the goodness of our model. And finally, we want to employ principles like randomization and blocking to allow for the detection of drift, um, influence of, of these uncontrolled parameters, whether they're known or unknown. We'll come back and visit all these principles in the next lecture. We go into more detail about design for regression. All right, what have we learned in lecture 64? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, please go back and review the material. Name the three types of inputs to a process. Define design of experiments. What are the three uses of experimental design that we've discussed? For regression to a straight line, what is the most efficient design? And finally, when regressing to a straight line, what design produces uniform leverage? That's it for our lecture today. We're going to visit the topic of design for regression in more detail in the next lecture. Till then.